No lucky shoes today, no lucky suit, maybe a lucky robe. I'm going to run out of lucky, aren't I? It's not exactly a lucky robe. There have been two occasions when I needed this particular robe, this one in particular, the one that I am wearing in this moment. I've actually needed it, and I think you will agree on two occasions. There was one occasion when I needed to deliver a message, and it was not going to be an easy message to deliver. It was the kind of message that could actually get me in trouble, but it was one of those that I felt like I was called to share. And it was one of those moments that I really needed to get myself out of the way. And in that moment, that's what the robe symbolized. It's not about what I'm wearing. It's not about my preparation, my equipment, my education, my intellect. I must get myself out of the way. And I wore a robe into a contemporary service where robes aren't part of the custom. But it was something that I needed to do. I felt like to get myself out of the way, that symbolism, this is not about me. Has anyone ever been in a situation where you felt like you needed to get yourself out of the way? I hope you've never been in this particular situation. It was also a contemporary service. And about five minutes before the service was to begin, my favorite pants that I had worn over and over and over and over and over again, the zipper burst. <laughs> it actually did. I didn't have time to run home to change clothes, so in that moment, I was grateful for a robe. <laughs> yeah, I know. In church, and he's telling stories like that. In all honesty, I've been somewhat ambivalent about robes. Robes carry a symbol. They're a symbol. And we assign meaning to symbols. It's often the case that that symbol has more to do with the meaning we have assigned to it than the symbol itself. Part of the reason I was concerned about a robe and what it symbolizes, this very robe. I was serving as a minister at First Christian Church of Atlanta in the deep south like Florida where it gets hot. And we had decided that we would go without robes for the summer in a, what was referred to as a traditional service. And at the end of the service, at the end of the summer, when fall had arrived, we went back to wearing robes. And on the first Sunday that I wore the robe again, a person approached me. She said, I'm so glad you've gone back to wearing a robe. It's so much more dignified. And I thought, well, what does that mean? I'm not sure what that means. Many of you have heard in my short time here that each one of us is a child of God. That each one of us has infinite dignity and value. So if this robe in any way sets me apart from others, then I'm not sure I appreciate that symbolism. I'm not sure. I didn't draw any conclusions necessarily, but it became evident a short while later. There's a woman named Gloria who trusted the sign that reads like so many church signs. All are welcome here. And she risked crossing that great divide between historically white churches and historically black churches. And on one particular Sunday, I had gotten carried away with my sermon. I'd come out of the pulpit. I was down at the bottom of the chancel, and I'd gotten pretty emotional, and Gloria followed me. She followed my energy, and she said, 
Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to follow you, Lord. Praise God. After the service, someone approached me and they said, Gloria's left. Someone said something to her and she's pretty hurt. I said, what do you mean? They said someone approached her and said that the way she worshiped wasn't very dignified. But she didn't believe God wanted her to worship like that. I rushed across the narthex and Gloria was already in the parking lot. And I said, Gloria, can I talk to you for just a moment? Not now, pastor, not now. I said, just a minute, Gloria. Can I talk to you? And with the injury that was evident from the guttural sound, she said, it hurts, pastor. It hurts. And I thought about what it means to be dignified. Gloria, the person who didn't recognize it, who said those hurtful things, each one of us is a child of God. Robe or no robe. Our dignity is in our DNA. We have infinite value and worth. There's no need for divisions based on race, economic status, nationality, who we love. We were created by one creator, all of us children of God. I've been cautioned by my wife who knows me better than I know myself that I share those phrases quite often, and so I thought they're indispensable, so I need to bring them to life in these stories if I can. When I was in middle school, I was in the band, if you can believe that. I was so gifted, they allowed me to play the snare drum only. (laughs) And that lasted until eighth grade. It was evident that that was not my calling. I'm in awe of the people who have those musical gifts. On one particular day, I was in the back of the band room where the drums were, and Mr. Phillips, who was known throughout the state, to get the highest scores when we would go to be evaluated. It became evident to those of us that were in the band that he saw us as a means to an end and not as an end in ourselves. And the contrast between Mr. Phillips, who was a truly celebrated band director, and Dennis, who happened to hold the lowest status in a top-down society. Again, I grew up in the Deep South, and 40 years ago, racial tensions were even more acute than they are today. Dennis understood the assignment. Someone somewhere instilled in Dennis that one's dignity has nothing to do with the color of one's skin. One's dignity has nothing to do with one's station, one's rank. He understood the assignment. In a middle school that was roughly 50% white and 50% black, he was a witness to what it means to be a person of dignity, to treat all persons equally with the same inherent dignity that we all have. 
By the time I reached ninth grade, my academic journey was not going too well. So my mother made extraordinary sacrifices to send me to a private school. There are all kinds of symbols, aren't they, that mean different things in our lives, like railroad tracks, school just across the tracks. During our first basketball game, my team now at the private school lost to the school just across the tracks. And at the end of that game, my team started chanting something I'd never heard before. That's all right, that's okay, you'll be working for us one day. Oh, whoa, wait a minute now. This line between who is us and who is them, what's that about? These divisions, like the ones Paul was writing about when he wrote to the church in Corinth, these divisions among you. My personal opinion is that it was a poor translation, be of the same mind and be of the same purpose. In my in-depth look at this passage, that word same is the Greek word autos, and it's personal in nature. It's personal. I think the better translation would have been not just be of one mind and be of one purpose, but be one-minded. One-minded. What will cause us to be one? To be of one purpose. Our purpose is to be one. That's what Jesus prayed. That was his last prayer in the earshot of his disciples, that we would be one. In what ways have we been conditioned to think of one another as ones. The power of the cross. The power of the cross is that it reveals that God is willing to go to any length to demonstrate that we are all God's children. There is no length to which God will not go to cross the divide, to bring us together. We were created to be in whole relationship with God. Our brothers and sisters, and even within ourselves. God knows we live in a divided world, don't we? And Jesus prayed that we would be one. Jesus embodied, God took on human form, proclaiming the kingdom of God, where God's love reigns and is operative in every realm. We, the church, are the body of Christ. We are called to embody the one-mindedness the one purposefulness that Jesus embodied. We look at the world and wonder, what can I do? It begins at the grocery store.
It was during the holiday season, I was standing in line, and there was a person who came in with a bag of coins, and he was headed to the machine that'll convert coins into bills. I don't know precisely what his situation was, but you could see on his face that he was distressed. There was an urgent need. I can imagine. He was a little younger than I am, probably had kids at home, and he was concerned about what might be waiting for them. After he had converted his coins into change, I saw something extraordinary. The person in front of me had observed this. And as the gentleman was leaving with the bills that he had converted, the person in front of me said, excuse me, sir, excuse me, you dropped this. You dropped this. And the man turned around and he started to protest. He started to say, that's not, but he said, you dropped this. And he looked him in the eye, he said, you dropped this. This is yours. He looked into the man's eyes and asserted his dignity. He didn't want to bring attention to this person's need. He recognized his dignity. And I thought to myself, that is dignified. That's what dignity is all about. Whether it's big, whether it's small, whether it's right in front of us in a grocery store, what does it take to cross the divide? My prayer for us this morning as the church, the body of Christ, that we, like him, will fully embody the love of God. Wherever our feet may take us, and in whoever's presence we may find ourselves, that we will see ourselves and all of God's children as people of infinite dignity, infinite worth, simply by virtue of the reality that every person is a child of God. That's my prayer for you, that's my prayer for me, that's my prayer for all of God's children. Amen.